Why go forward? Well, number one, because you've been in Egypt too long. Come on, you've lived as a victim too long. You've lived as a slave too long. It's time to rise up, stretch forward for the prize of being that man or that woman, that daddy, that mama that that kid needs. Come on, to be the leader that your household needs, to be that entrepreneur that our society needs, to unlock the gifts, the talents, the potential, the possibility that God's placed on the inside of you. It's time for you to prosper in the calling of God that he has for you. Are you saying God wants me to have more money? Yes. He wants you to have more money. He wants you to have more influence. Come on. He wants you to have more wisdom. Yes. Well, I just want enough for, for, you know, for me and my household. You selfish thing, you. You've never met Jesus. Come on. We've got a calling that goes beyond us four and no more. Well, today I want to share a message with you on why go forward. We're talking about faith. Uh, this last month, and uh, we're going to continue. And I'm talk- I want to talk to you about f- how faith will help you to go forward. It'll help you to forget your past. We're going to start with Hebrews chapter 10. Going to read from verse 38 and 39. I love how it says in the Amplified. It says, but my righteous one shall live by faith. Oh, I like that. We live by? Fish live by water. We live by faith. It's not an option. So faith is the essence that we live by. And what is faith? It's trusting God. It's taking God at his word. And so this is the only way to please God. It's not our penance, not our good works, not our good deeds, not our good intentions. We please God when we show that we trust him. So it says, my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, ooh, look at that word shrink. If he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we're not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. So when we, so you have, a, you have a choice here. You can live by faith and please God and appropriate the promises that God has for you, or you could shrink back and live a really small life and be intimidated and live in fear and worry and anxiety, and it's like you end up in a place you don't want to be. So every, every one of us, every day, we can choose to live by faith with our hearts filled with confidence from God, fueled up with God, living in his presence, taking God's perspective over my own perspective. Amen. And it's available for each and every one of us. So God wants you and I to live in confidence with our heart trusting him that God's got it. Everything you're facing right now didn't take God. Listen, none none of it took God by surprise. Isn't that good news? The challenges you're facing, maybe in relationship or finances or in your work or your health or some of the challenges that you're facing, listen, God knew all about it and he wants you to trust him in that circumstance because when we trust him, God, when we begin to rest in him, he works on our behalf. So our our next verse, uh, look at Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14, because here we see the apostle Paul uh, writing and he says this, but one thing I do, everyone say one thing. Now, this is a great insight because we live in such a, you know, busy world and we often think that we're multitaskers. By the way, did you know that multitasking does not exist? You're doing one thing at a time. You can't do more than one thing. You might have a lot of things on your plate, but you still deal with them one thing at a time. Now, Paul said this, this one thing I do, and what's that? Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward. So again, here we see this, how faith, how faith operates is that we're forgetting those things that are, that are behind us. How many got a lot of things in your past that you really wish you could totally just take an eraser, you know, a Mr. Clean and just get rid of all of those things? Yeah, only about four of us are being, telling the truth. Everybody else here, you know, will be giving an altar call. You give your lives to Jesus. God will forgive you for lying. And, uh, but we all got stuff. But here's what Paul says. Listen, I, you know, when you buy a car, how many know you've got a little rear view mirror that's this big? Most people here in Calgary, a lot of people in my neighborhood, I don't think they ever use those things. It's like the blinker fluid. I think all the cars are low on blinker fluid, especially BMWs. I don't know what it is, but BMWs seem to be very low on blinker fluid. Um, I need to, you know, let them know. I'm going to pull one of them over one day and say, you need some blinker fluid. Mm, they just turn. But you know, you have the car manufacturers, they give you a little rear view mirror and then a great big windshield, right? And why is that? Because what's more important is not what's behind you, but what's in front of you. And so uh, uh, it's okay to uh, once in a while glance in the rear view mirror, especially the side mirrors when you're turning with the signal, the indicator. 
Not after you've turned, you turn it on. No, it's before. Yeah, BMW, BMW drivers, it's before, before. Then you, you first you check. You check that rear view mirror, you check the side mirror, and you do a shoulder check, depending on which way you're turning. And then, when it's safe to do so, you turn the indicator, and a little light will go like this. And then you turn, and then if you cut the person off, you wave with all five digits. Just helping the BMW drivers. And if I've offended you today, I'm just trying to help you. The Lord, you know, disciplines those he loves, and I sh- just wanted to help the rest of us to stay alive from your bad driving. Okay. <laughs> By the way, none of that was in my notes, but something happened this morning on the way to church that I just need to talk to you about. If that was you, please come for prayer at the end. One thing I do, forgetting. Oh, I love that. Forgetting. Forgetting what's behind you. Come on, forget your past. God's not holding it against you. Forgetting those things which are behind me and reaching forward to the things ahead. I want you to know, you might feel like, ah, my best days are behind me. Or maybe you feel that, well, if I never went through that divorce, or if I didn't have that bankruptcy, or if I didn't do that, and you look back at the glory days and you think that those are your best days, but no, I want you to know, here Paul is saying, I'm forgetting what's behind me and I'm reaching forward, why? Because God is the author and the finisher of your faith. Every one of us here can take courage and find hope knowing that God is not through with us yet. Come on, he's still working in us, he's still for us, and he's still got a plan for your life. God, God's love is bigger than our mistakes. Amen. Amen. <laughs> that was with conviction, whoever said that. All right. And he said, I press, to, I press toward the goal for the prize. There's a reward in living in faith. Those that come to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder. God loves to set prizes. Now, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how do we make changes, how do we go forward, and sometimes we can fall into the trap thinking, well, it's about my, uh, my willpower. And, uh, you know, sometimes willpower, you know, sometimes we think that willpower is like this big muscle, you know, and some people have really strong willpower, and other people have really weak willpower. And what, we, what researchers are telling us is that willpower is not really like a muscle, it's more like a switch. You can read more about it in a book called Switch by the Heath brothers. Dan and Chip Heath wrote a book called Switch, how to make, you know, fast changes really quickly. And uh, so what they discovered about uh, willpower, it's more like a switch, okay? It's like, it's, it, if you got it connected to the right sources, you can actually make real fast changes and significant changes in a relatively short period of time. And so what they've discovered is that you've got to get your intellect and uh, your emotions to be in harmony. And if you can get them to agree, then you can see change happen fast. And so the picture that they write in this book is they show a, an elephant, which is your emotions, okay? It's powerful. Your emotions are like, you know, it's so easy to fly off the handle, right? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm speaking about myself, about my driving. And, uh, you know, when, when BMW drivers, yeah. And, uh, and so you got this emotion is an elephant, E, think E, elephant, E, emotion. And it's massive. It's powerful. It, you know, you can't stop it. Now, there's a little rider on top. Everyone say rider. Okay, letter R, reason. And so what we need to do is to have reason on top of the elephant and uh, to make this, you know, you get those things in harmony and uh, then you can flip the switch. And so what do you got to do? Well, you need to do two things. One is you got to instruct, you got to inform the rider. You got to give him the facts. You got to give him the clarity and, uh, you know, the logic behind it. So you got to engage your brain. Everyone say engage your brain. Okay, just because we live by faith doesn't mean we, we, we neglect this, all right? So you want to be educated up here, but then what do you do with the elephant? You know, you don't educate the elephant, you inspire the elephant. And so you do that, and so you, what do you want to do is you want to let your emotions get a picture of, of something amazing, and then you want to give the logic and the facts into the reader, and then the next thing you got to do is show them just the next step. Everyone say the next step. So if you will simply educate your mind, if you'll get a picture, get a vision board, right? And, uh, you know, if you want to get in health, you know, take a picture of uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger and cut out his head, put yours there, put that on the fridge, get something to inspire your faith. See, that's what I did. Okay. uh, But you knew that. 
Arnold's got my head on his body now. And uh, okay, and uh, but <laughs> I'm speaking faith, you guys. You know, faith sees the invisible. Okay, it's not a reality yet, but it's okay. Um, but I'm, what, am I, what am I doing? I'm inspiring my emotions, and then my logic says, okay, Anthony, to get that, you know, what do you have to do? What's your next step? Well, my next step is put a lock on the refrigerator. Or whatever it is, set a plan, right? Make it, make it attainable. You, you don't need to look, you know, 20 years down the road. What is my next step? What is the next logical thing, okay? Maybe it is to uh, set up a, an exercise program, right? And so, uh, you know, and you got to make it, uh, anyway, I'm not going to go there into my whole exercise program, but, but you're getting the point of it. And so when you do those three things, willpower, it's like, it's not really the power of the will, it's the power behind the switch. So what you do is you do, when you, when you engage your emotions, and your reason and you have the next step willpower is easy and so never question something i don't i don't have the willpower to do that no just educate the rider come on instruct the rider inspire the elephant get your get your emotions engaged because your emotions are powerful and then just know what is your next step you do that and you can see change happen really quick sustaining lasting change all right so that was not in my notes that was not planned but it was just some good stuff so paul says i i press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of god in christ jesus now notice this i like that word upward call what does that mean? It means that God has a call for each and every one of us. Well, you, are you saying that I'm called, Pastor? Yeah. Every one of you are called to be in full-time ministry. Every member in the body of Christ is a minister. Some are ordained and they're in the five-fold ministry like pastors and evangelists and teachers and apostles and prophets. And their job is to equip the saints. But every one of you, there's no such thing as a part-time Christian. Yeah, I'm a Christian Sunday morning. And, uh, but Monday, ooh, ooh, Friday night, look out. No, uh, no, we're, we're, every one of us, we're ministers. There's a calling on your life to represent Jesus right where you live, where you work, where you play, where you go to school. You are God's representative. And so every one of us, there's no part-time anointings. You are anointed and called by God. But I like this thought, the upward call. What does that mean? It means that God is always calling us higher. He's calling us to grow. He's calling us to grow forward. He's calling us to increase our leadership capacity. Come on. He's, he's calling us to keep developing. I like what one of the early church fathers said. He said, the glory of God is a man fully alive. God wants you to be fully alive, fully engaged, fully in, 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 engaged in, in stepping out in your calling, in your destiny in the plan that he has for you. And so it's time for us to obey the upward call because God wants, hey, he wants, us to, he wants us to step up and rise up. He's calling man to stand up and begin to lead. Come on. He wants man that will lay down their lives for their wife. He wants man that'll be the spiritual leaders in their home. It's an upward call. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. And, uh, you know, but it's amazing that when you get this strange theology in the church, I heard someone saying this this week. They said, you know, I just want it to be all of God and none of me. Okay, that sounds really, really religious and it sounds very holy, but it's completely unbiblical. God loves you. You're his idea. He designed you. And you want to throw that all in the trash? No, what God wants you to do is he wants you to be the most incredible version of yourself because you are his workmanship recreated in Christ Jesus for good works that God's foreordained that you should walk in them. This is only one of you. God's been thinking about you since eternity. It's all of God and none of me. How about it's God living on the inside of you and you and God doing life together? God likes your personality, unless you're a BMW driver. <laughs> I'm meddling. Can one of the ushers check the parking lot? I'm looking for the license plate. No, I'm just kidding. CLX8828. Okay. <laughs> okay, that's my license plate. All right. But there's an upward call. Come on, guys. God wants us, you know, he wants to raise you up. You know, it's funny how religion wants to push you down and control you. Okay, let's, can I get into my text? Okay. My text today, because I'm talking about going forward, it's found in Exodus chapter 14, verse 8 and 20. 
So this is the fulfillment of prophecy. God had promised the Israelites. He promised Abraham. He said, look, you know what? Your descendants are going to end up in Egypt. They're going to be slaves for 400 years. But at the end of 400 years, I'm going to bring them out with a mighty hand. And they're going to plunder. And they're going to, the Egyptians. And so reading from verse 8. We're going to read a fair bit of uh, passage of scripture. But then we're going to unpack it. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the children of Israel, and the children of Israel went out with boldness. Everyone say with boldness. I like that. With that word, it means triumphantly. And uh, so the Egyptians pursued them, and all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen, his army, and overtook them camping by the sea beside Pahiroth, before Baal Zephon. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, I like this, because there were no graves in Egypt, what are they doing? They're looking back. They're in a difficult situation, and all of a sudden, the past didn't look that bad after all. Yeah, we were slaves. Yeah, they whipped us with scorpions. Yes, you know, they, they treated us horribly, and they're killing all our firstborn, throwing them to the river, feeding them to the crocodiles. Yeah, but it wasn't that bad. So now, they, so now they're in a difficult situation. It doesn't, isn't the Bible amazing? Because it understands human nature, doesn't it? Because when we have a rough time, things, God, where are you? That's it. I'm not going to church anymore because things aren't working out perfect in my life. Listen, everyone goes through difficult seasons. Jesus said, be of good cheer. I, you know, in the world, he says, in the world, you will have tribulation. All right, we're not preaching pie in the sky, some fanciful fantasy. We're talking about real life experience. And so Jesus said, in the world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. And so what does it mean? It means that, that hey, he's going to give you his victory. He'll give you the way to overcome. So he goes on to say this, and he says, so, these, so they're looking back, and they said, uh, weren't, weren't there enough graves in Egypt? Have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring? Now, now they're blaming the leader. They're, bra- they're blaming Pastor Moses. Can you pray for your pastors? You should see some of the funny emails I get. I, I should read some of them to you because they're quite funny. Another sermon, another day. Then they said, for it would have been better for us to serve. We would have been better if we were serving the Egyptians. Would have been better for us to be slaves, giving our boys into the crocodile-infested Nile River, that we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. I like this. He says, so he's thinking he's saying the right thing, but he's not saying the right thing. He says, stand still. He says, just be still. And and do not be afraid. See the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. (laughs) By the way, interested in that word forever. Um, How many know that Egypt exists? And Israel has seen Egypt many times since then. Uh, So sometimes the Bible, when it says forever, it's speaking about uh, an an exaggerated, uh, uh, you know, extrapolation of terms. You know, when it says forever, you know, it doesn't always mean forever, but forever in their lifetime. Just a theological insight there. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. And the Lord said to Moses, what are you doing praying to me? You know, (laughs) right? Notice all the Israelites, they want to go back to Egypt. They want to go back to slavery. They want to go back to giving up their next generation to the crocodiles. They want to go back. They're complaining, Moses, this is your fault. You know, this is, we're blaming you. And he's like, no, God's going to fight for you. You know, stand still, watch and see God fight for you. And then so Moses says to God and God says to him, why are you praying to me? Sometimes there's a time to stop praying. It's a time to, there's a time for action. And so, I, 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 I love this. And he says, why do you cry to me? And he says, here's your answer. Tell the children of Israel to go forward. Problem was, they had a rock here. The Egyptians were coming behind them. And they got a Red Sea in front of them. And God says, go forward. I think, what, why is that? Listen, God's plan for you is to go forward against all impossibilities. God's going to make a way for you in the wilderness. You might be looking at your business saying, I don't know how it's going to happen in this economy. Listen, God, he's a, he can split that Red Sea. Come on, he can give you favor with the, with the CRA. He can open up doors with your landlord. Come on, you can buy that building. God wants you to be possibility-minded. doesn't want you to be a slave to your past. He wants you to shed that slave mindset, that 
that victim mentality and to rise up and know that Christ lives in you and you are more than a conqueror. You got a covenant with Almighty God. He's your partner. He's your friend. He lives in you and he will fight for you. But sometimes you got to take a step of faith. Come on. Even God can't, can't steer a parked car. I was going to make a BMW reference there, but I think I've made my point fairly clear. <laughs> and what does he say? Tell the people to go forward. He goes, lift up your rod, stretch. Everyone say stretch. <laughs> right? You're either stretching or you're shrinking. What do you want to do? It's so hard for me. You know, life is my family. I'm a first generation Canadian. Man, had this guy come to my door the other day, just yesterday, drop off a parcel. So, you know, fine looking African man. As I looked at him, I said, are you from Nigeria? I know I'm a boomer and I'm not supposed to guess people's nationality. And I don't care because the fact is this, I'm just interested in people. I love people. And uh, so this guy he comes, I said, you from Nigeria? No, I'm from Cameroon. I said, your neighbors. And he goes, yeah. He goes, you know West Africa? I said, I know West Africa. I don't know much about Cameroons. I said, uh, but uh, do you eat suya in, in, the, in Cameroon? And he goes, oh yeah, we eat suya. I said, do you do it with the little, little limes in the newspaper and onions? And he goes, oh, you're my people. And next thing you know, I'm having fellowship with this guy from, Cam from Cameroon. I, God bless Cameroon. They have suya. I thought it was only the Nigerians were blessed with that delicacy. And uh, so we get talking and I said, how long have you been here? He goes, one month. I said, I'm so glad that you are in Canada. We need people like you. And, I, and he's, the guy's looking at me like, who is this nut? I just came to drop off some flowers. And this guy's like, I'm so glad you're in Canada. And I said, hey, I said, let me tell you, my family, they came from Italy. My grandparents were illiterate. They never learned to read or write. They worked, at my, my grandfather dug ditches. My grandmother washed aprons for the butcher. And I said, my mom and dad, my mom had grade six education. That's it. I said, but they did well. And I think about you Africans that come here. You're so uber educated. You're here to work hard. You're going to do what it takes. You're going to make Canada a better place. I said, what are you, by the way? He goes, I'm an engineer. I said, I knew it, you know. <laughs> like, I mean, he's driving delivery because he's just new. I tell you, what an opportunity. I don't know where I was going with that. Uh, I think I was talking about mindsets or something. Take action. Thank you. Thank you. See, I knew. I was just seeing if anybody's paying attention. But you know, you sometimes you've got to take that step forward. And so, all right, we've got to keep going because uh, I almost finished my introduction text. <laughs> and then he says, and the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I indeed will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them, so I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over his army, his chariots and his horsemen. Then the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, and I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. Now, there's another part. I used to stop that story right there, but I missed something that I think that something profound happens in the next few verses that I never noticed until yesterday when I was just you know, doing some yard work and had my headphones in. I was just going over my message. And look at the next verse. And the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel. So remember, when they came out of Egypt and they're, they're leaving, there was the, the angel of the Lord went before them and there was a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. And it was always before them. It was always before them. So they knew which direction to go. When the cloud would lift up and go, they would just follow the cloud. They'd follow the presence of God. Right? So now the cloud, God leads them to this place where they're, where they're trapped between a rock and a hard place. The Egyptian army, Pharaoh and his chariots, 600 strong, are behind them. The ocean is in front of them. And all of a sudden, the cloud and the angel of the Lord goes out of sight and goes behind them. Isn't that interesting? And it says, and it went and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus it was a cloud and darkness to the one... And it gave light by night to the other so that one did not come near the other all that night. Why is that? Because God caused a east wind to hit that Red Sea, to split it open over a mile wide. I know in Cecil B. DeMille's classic, it looked like it was about, you know, 40 yards. But for 3 million people to make it through on one night, they had to be at least 880 people. If you give them each 6 feet, 3 feet on either side, you know, to carry their stuff, their 
cows and camels and their carts and, and whatever. It would take, you know, if they were, went to almost 880 people wide, uh, it would take them uh, one night to get through so they could do it. So when God split the Red Sea, I'm telling you, it was really, really wide. But so that happened during the night. But interesting to know that this cloud went behind. Now, why is that? Because sometimes God needs us to step out in faith and, uh, you know, and just take God at his word. So now the angel is not in front of them. The pillar of fire is not. Now they have to trust God. They got to take God at his word. Sometimes you're not going to feel anything, but you're going to just have to dig down deep and take God at his word. But notice what happened. It went behind them and it hid them from the Egyptians. On their side, it was light, but on the Egyptian side, it was dark. And why does God do that? I think God is saying, look, I have so completely separated you from your past. You used to be under those Egyptians. You used to be a slave. You used to be in darkness, but I brought you out of that darkness and into the light. Go forward. God is with you. Wow, I, don't, I never saw that before. And so why go forward? Why go forward? Well, number one, because you've been in Egypt too long. Come on, you've lived as a victim too long. You've lived as a slave too long. It's time to rise up, stretch forward for the prize of being that man or that woman, that daddy, that mama that that kid needs. Come on, to be the leader that your household needs, to be that entrepreneur that our society needs, to unlock the gifts, the talents, the potential, the possibility that God's placed on the inside of you. It's time for you to prosper in the calling of God that he has for you. Are you saying God wants me to have more money? Yes. He wants you to have more money. He wants you to have more influence. Come on. He wants you to have more wisdom. Yes. Yes. Well, I just want enough for, for, you know, for me and my household. You selfish thing, you. You've never met Jesus. Come on. We've got a calling that goes beyond us four and no more. Mm. What happens when wealth gets transferred into the hands of the wicked? People get enslaved, they get abused, they get manipulated, put it in the hands of a drug dealer, what happens? More kids are introduced to drug and addictions and that, everything that comes with that lifestyle, the crime and the destroyed lives. Drug dealer is going into the 7-Eleven and he's got a wad of $100 bills in elastic, falls out of his pocket. I pick it up. What does that money become? My money is what it becomes. Now think about it. In his hand, a generation is enslaved with drugs and addiction and crime. In my hand, it goes into the work of God. It becomes a blessing to somebody else. That's why the Bible talks about the end time wealth transfer. He says the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just. God's looking for partners on the earth. Been in Egypt too long. How long are you going to live in that past? Second reason why we, and, 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 it's, and it's interesting. I mean, my notes are on the app, so I'm not going to get, I'm not, not going to go through my points. But I was thinking about this verse. In Deuteronomy 6.23, it says, He brought us out from there that He might bring us in to give us the land which He swore to our fathers. God's plan is not just getting you out of slavery. It's not just getting you out of Egypt, the world system. It's not just about getting you free from your past, no matter how traumatic or painful it was. He's bringing you out. Why? His ultimate goal is not just to get you to that place from, you know, of survival or security. He wants to get you into a land that's flowing with milk and honey. He wants you to bring in a land of promise. What's that? The land, hey, of promises. What are the promises that you can claim? He brought us out. The ultimate goal is to bring us in. A land that's flowing with milk and honey. Egypt was a land of leeks and garlic. It grew from the ground. And so, and there was just, Egypt was a land of just enough. They had just enough to survive. And so the wilderness, well, actually it was not enough because they, let me back up. Land of Egypt was the land of not enough. They were slaves. They had no freedom. They had no choice. They didn't have enough straw even to build the bricks for the pyramids or whatever. The wilderness was the land of just enough. God provided manna every day and a double amount on Friday because they couldn't pick on the Sabbath on Saturday. But it was just enough. And if anything was left over, it turned to worms. It was just enough every day. But the land of promise was a land flowing with milk and honey. I like that. It wasn't growing up from the ground, but it was flowing, you know, milk 
Come on, honey, it's flowing. Why? Because God's wealth is meant to flow into your life. It's coming from a different source. Come on, a little bit of milk and honey. Put that in my tea any day. Come on, somebody. He brought us out because he wants to bring you in. He doesn't just want to break the power of addiction and sin and guilt and that coercive religion and the legality and the, and the condemnation you've been living out. He wants to bring you in to his light. And to do that, you've got to let go of that past. You gotta put a curtain between, then the cross is the greatest curtain. It's, it means death to your past and light to your future. And so God wants you to keep your eyes looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy, everyone say joy, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the suffering and the shame of the cross. Do you know what? You gotta keep your eyes on what's the next step. I tell you, the next step for some of you here today, this morning, is to receive Jesus. It's simply to say, yes, God, you got a better way. I'm tired of trying to live this in my own strength. I'm tired of trying to figure this out with my own mind. God, I need your peace. I need your strength. I need your wisdom in my life. That is the next step. Because let me tell you, your next step to go forward, unlock the miracle. What did Moses have to do? God said to him, take your staff and I want you to strike the Red Sea. Jewish historians tell us that Moses waded out into the river, the Red Sea, until the water was up to his neck. And it was like a do or die moment. And then he took his rod and he smacked the water and the Red Sea began to split. But he had to go all the way in. And it, what did God say? Stretch forth your rod. Some of you, this is going to be a stretch for you. You know what? I'm going to ask you in just a moment to give your life to Jesus. And I'm gonna say, every one of you here that wants to give your life to Christ, would you raise your hand? And what are you doing? You're just stretching out, saying, God, I'm available. God, I want you, I need you. And if you will do that, God will meet you. And I don't know what you're facing, but I, I, I know this, that God does not consult your past when he determines your future because you are forgiven. Come on, he put that wall, he put the cloud, he put the angel, the pillar of fire between the past and the, between the past and the future. I want you to know that your past was settled at the cross. You're not disqualified. The accuser of the brethren, Satan wants to remind you. He wants to put you under condemnation and guilt, but God wants to inspire you. He wants you to see there's a land of promise. I'm bringing you out so I can bring you in. He wants to bring you out of darkness to bring you into the light of his family.